What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of the Man Cave Podcast, brought to you by Hy-Vee and Toys and Ford. Dan Casper here with you, as always, for every single episode of the Man Cave Podcast. We're going to continue to talk some more Packers and uh, 49ers. I was almost going to say Vikings on this. I don't know why. I keep thinking Vikings. Don't know why. Don't know why. Anyways, but uh, Packers, 49ers, getting set for Saturday night. And I did this last week when we were getting ready for, for Packers and Cowboys. Uh, the 10 most important Packer people for this game, for the Packers to win this game. And last week, we had quite a few guys that, that you know we listed, I listed in my top 10 that had themselves a game. Darnell Savage was in there. Matt LaFleur was in there. Jair Alexander, Aaron Jones, Jordan Love, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's do it again. Let's do it again. I want to do this again. Top 10 most important Packers people in this game. Top 10 most important Packers people in this game. Who do you think they are? Try to, if you can, maybe put them in in order here, but try to rank them, if if you will, okay? Try to rank them. Who would be number one? Who would be number 10 on your list there, all right? Let's go through my list. So, again, we did this last week, and quite a few of the guys that uh, we had we had listed on there uh, performed they were they were key contributors to that win key contributors to that win I'm like okay so let's let's do this again let's do this again so starting off at number 10 here now I've got my reasons and again we're all gonna have different thoughts we're gonna have different uh different you know picks and so and so might think no that's that's not one of the most important ones it's our it's our own thoughts our own opinions it's all good it's all good number 10 I'm gonna go Josh Myers though I'm gonna go Josh Myers, the center for the Green and Gold, as being a one of the one of the most important Packers people in this game. You could probably pick any offensive lineman for this game. I wouldn't argue with you. I don't think a lot of people would argue with you. And I thought about putting the entire offensive line there, and I'm like, no, because then I'm already cheating on my own question that I'm. That I'm giving you all. So I forced myself to pick just one. And the reason I went with, with Josh Myers. Now, when you look at this 49ers defensive front, I mean, you've got Bosa, right? You've got Chase Young. Then you've got an interior rush for the 49ers. That's pretty, pretty good over there, too. So when it boiled down to it, I'm like, okay, Zach Tom's playing at an elite level right now. I've got confidence in him that he's going to be able to hold his own on the right side. I initially thought of putting Walker over there because he's still a little young. He's still, you know, like, okay, you know, can we can we full, you know, really really trust him here, but he's been playing really well. He's been pretty doing really good over there on the left side. So, looking at the interior line. Now, if you want to put John Runner Jr. under, you absolutely can. That was my next thought on there, but I I went with Myers because, well, I mean, he's kind of calling out the, the assignments and, and up there. He's, he's got a very important role for this game. And, you know, he's going to have to deal with Hargrave, or, you know, Javon Hargrave, Armstead, who both finished in the top 16 in pass rush win rate for, for defensive tackles, defensive linemen. Javon Kinlaw is another guy to, to kind of pay attention to up there. Myers, I think, is going to have his hands full, not only in terms of just blocking, calling out some assignments, not just in pass protection, but opening up run running lanes, helping opening up running lanes against the run. San Francisco is at allowing 4.1 yards per attempt. It's about league average right now. But past even, you know, getting after the quarterback, these guys on that defensive front, for for the 49ers, they can do it. And if they're able to generate a pass rush up the middle and maybe force Jordan Love to, to hit that edge there a little bit where Chase Young or Bosa's, Bosa's waiting for them, 
Could be a long day. So that's that's why I went with Myers. That's why I went with Myers because, again, you could pick any other offensive lineman if you wanted. I have a little bit more trust in Zach Tom. Walker's playing really well. Elton Jenkins, pretty solid over there. Kind of came down to Runyon and, and Myers for me. Runyon might be, you know, again, splitting some snaps here and there with Sean Ryan. So I went with Myers, the man in the middle, the center, as my offensive lineman pick. He's got to have a really good game in terms of the protection, opening up the running game, opening up those holes, assignments, calling stuff out, et cetera, et cetera. You know the drill. Number nine. On my list. He was in our top 10 last week, and I'm going to bring him in again. Darnell Savage. I'm going to go Darnell Savage for this one. Um, when you look at it, this this offense from, from the 49ers, so many weapons for, for Brock Purdy over there, whether it's Christian McCaffrey Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, right? You've you've got a ton of weapons. Then there's the Mr. Consistent and maybe sometimes often forgot George Kittle. Maybe kind of take it for granted. Like, oh, yeah, George Kittle's still there. George Kittle, again, over 1,000 yards this season. Probably got a good chance to be another All-Pro over there. Darnell Savage might be the guy that has to try to slow him down. Or maybe Darnell Savage is the guy that is going to have to play a little coverage and a little nickel slot to kind of help slow down Debo Samuel because Debo Samuel is a Swiss Army knife, is is a guy that the 49ers are going to use all across the field, coming out of the backfield slot outside. Darnell Savage is going to have, I think, a key role in this game because of all the different assignments that he might be given, whether it is covering George Kittle, whether it is you know, playing some coverage in the back ends. It's got to be all over the field. Matt LaFleur, earlier this week, even saying Darnell Savage is one of their best communicators, if not the best communicator on, on the defensive side. And... I think a big key to to victory for for the Packers in this game is going to be that communication on defense because the 49ers are going to do so many misdirections, going to try to confuse you. They run a similar offense to the Packers where you've got the same for, you know, block, same formation but multiple plays coming out of that formation. They're going to try to confuse the defense. Communication is going to be such a huge factor in this thing. We've talked about the the lack of communication at, at times this year or the struggles of communications. So if Darnell Savage is legitimately one of their best ones, if not the best one, that puts a lot on his plate, puts a lot on his shoulders right now to go out there and ball out. He's going to have a role. He's going to have a role all across that defense. I think it's still kind of up in the air, you know, and this is a guy too that entered this year with with a contract, playing for a contract. I think it's still up in the air whether he's back in Green Bay or not, but he can help make that case with a big time game again this weekend against the 49ers. You got a bunch of guys that are going to be all around the field, a bunch of playmakers for the 49ers that are going to be all around the field. Darnell Savage is going to have to be a very 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 active member of that defense for the Packers to try to slow down this offense from uh, from San Francisco. Number eight, maybe a little bit lower for for some people, but hey, he's in the top ten still, Aaron Jones. Now, you probably could say, dude's got to be higher. I'm not going to argue with you. Probably should be higher. But right now, I got him at number eight for multiple reasons. One, just because he is the the catalyst for for this offense, he is the guy. He, if he's humming and he's rolling and he's having success, this offense is having success. 
But also, too, we talked about it earlier, earlier in the week, the, the time of possession, right, ball control. If Aaron Jones is having success at running the football, if he's having that success running the football, picking up five yards of carry, picking up first downs, creating thirds and third and shorts, you're keeping that 49ers offense off the field. You're keeping them on the sidelines there. I think such a huge thing for this Packers offense is going to have to be time of possession, ball control, long touchdown drives, six, seven-minute drives. And a big key to that is going to be Aaron Jones. Now, I think you know one thing, too, that kind of gets glossed over from, from this past game against the Cowboys, Aaron Jones did a couple other things that were pretty pivotal in that game, not just from running the football. He had an awesome blitz pickup against Micah Parsons. Remember when Micah Parsons looked like he got hurt, missed a couple plays? That was a big-time blitz pickup from, from Aaron Jones there. The guy could do multiple things. He may may look a little smaller compared to other running backs out there. The guy can hold his own. And going up against this San Francisco defense, especially with that uh, that defensive front, and you look at those very active linebackers, Fred Warner and such, if Aaron Jones can have himself another good day and make it a long day for those guys, Green Bay's got a really good shot. So Aaron Jones is at number eight. Again, probably could be higher, probably should be higher, but I got him at number eight on my list. Number seven, I'm going to go Rashawn Gary in this one. Um. When you look at the numbers for, for Brock Purdy and you look at the numbers from some of his losses, the guy turned the ball over quite a bit. I mean, the, the big one that really stands out is that Baltimore game when he threw four picks. But you look at some of the other games, a couple picks, that sort of stuff. Rashawn Gary, and now with Enoch Barre out, the depth is going to be tested over here. Packers like that rotation. They like keeping guys fresh. But now with your depth kind of missing a, a, a nice rotational piece over there. Puts a little bit more on the shoulders of Rashawn, Preston, Lucas Van Ness, but Rashawn Gary might be lined up more against the right tackle for the 49ers where you got Trent Williams over there on the left side. Preston Smith is going to have a battle. He's going to have a battle on his hands over there on the left side. That makes it even more important for Rashawn Gary to go out there and be that dominant pass rusher that we expect that we want to see going out there wreaking havoc in the backfield and you know not over pursuing and and not setting the edges and you know because he does have a tendency to do that at times but being that superstar that he's getting paid to be right a guy that can wreck a game with the depth taking a hit and with Preston Smith having a battle going up against Trent Williams puts a little bit more on Rashawn Gary's shoulders to help generate that pressure, a consistent pressure against Brock Purdy. You put him under pressure, the guy has shown, hey, he can turn the ball over. He will turn the ball over. Rashawn Gary, number seven for me. Number six, Jane Reed. Again, we talked about it uh, earlier in the week. When 49ers have a couple of really, really good corners, they got a really good secondary, starting secondary. Okay, it's going to be a long day, you know, for maybe a guy like Romeo Dobbs, or you know, if Christian Watson gets an increase in snap counts, or Wicks, or whoever the the outside corners may be, or the top two, you know, wide receivers may be at that point. But you know, Ward over there. For, for the 49ers, he's had a great year. Lenore's had a really good year. But if there is one, if there is a crack in that secondary, or if there is a, a crack in the defensive foundation, it might be a little bit with their depth at, at that cornerback spot. Because we talked about it earlier this week. Some teams like the Bengals, Vikings and such, they played a lot of three-receiver sets to try to expose that. And if that's the case... Jaden Reed is a guy then that has to take advantage of that. If he's going to be, 
you know, going up against the nickel corner, going to be in the slot, going to be a guy that's going to be active, you know, moving around the line of scrimmage, motioning, motioning, motion, motion, you know, motioning, yeah, motioning, right? Yeah, okay. Jet sweeps, backfield, all that sort of stuff. If the Packers try to exploit or try to attack that depth at the corner, knowing that, hey, the 49ers have a couple really good corners, we got to get other guys involved. Packers got depth at wide receiver. We know they got that depth. Can they use that to their advantage in this game? Can they use that depth? It starts with Jaden Reed. Maybe it's another Bo Melton type of game. But for me, I'm going to go with Reed because he can do a bunch of different things within this offense. He's been versatile that way. We've seen it this season. And I think the Packers have to get him in a position to really affect this game and and, and be a big-time player on the offensive side. Top five now. Number five for me, Matt LaFleur. Kyle Shanahan, yesterday, when he was talking a little bit with uh, with the media, uh, giving some praise to, to Matt LaFleur, saying that uh, Matt LaFleur does a really, you know, he says Matt does a really good job with the, with the quarterbacks and, and helping develop quarterbacks. And, well, Matt LaFleur is a Kyle Shanahan disciple, was Shanahan's quarterbacks coach, you know, Washington and Atlanta, so he, he, he kind of knows. But Matt LaFleur, again, has been in a zone with his play calling. He's taken it up a notch, in my opinion. He's gotten better. He's gotten to know his team. He's gotten to put. He's gotten better at putting guys in a position to affect games, to be successful. It seems like he's always kind of been a step ahead of opposing defensive coordinators. Can he do that again this week? against the 49ers and Steve Wilkes and in, in, uh, in that group. Can he do that again? Can he continue to do that? Can he continue to be aggressive and have that confidence? You know, get a little bit further into to the postseason or you get a little bit further in. Sometimes we see guys like, oh, okay, um, now let's try, you know, they, they kind of back off a little bit. They're trying to play it a little safe. Like, oh, wow, okay, we're this far now, and we got a shot to, to do something special. Maybe let's play a little bit safe. Can't do that. Can't do that in this game. He's got to continue to be aggressive. He's got to continue to have that confidence in his quarterback and that confidence in his play calling, too, because it's been really good. He's got to keep it up. He's got to have that foot on his gas. He can't. I think he learned a lesson in this game against the Cowboys, too. It doesn't matter how big of a lead they got. You keep those two feet on the gas pedal. He admitted it. It was a learning experience for him. Pulling those starters out. Don't do that. Because even, I'll say this, like my little guy Hudson, at that point he's like, you know, oh, Walt Packers got on And I'm like, you know what? I've seen a lot of crap. I've seen a lot of crap happen. I've seen some stupid comebacks that shouldn't happen before. I wasn't completely ready to say it yet. So he's got to keep that gas on, or he's got to keep that foot on the on the pedal for for this game. If they have a lead, don't get complacent. Not against this team. Number four, I'm going to go Quay Walker. I think Quay Walker, kind of similar to to Darnell Savage in a way where I think he is just going to be a guy that could be utilized a few different ways with within this defense. Whether it's helping slow down Christian McCaffrey in the running game and passing game. Whether it's coming on a blitz up the middle, trying to get into Brock Purdy's face. Whether it's maybe he's helping out a little bit in coverage with George Kittle you know, in that zone portion of the field. You know, I look at him as being the guy, one of the main guys in trying to slow down Christian McCaffrey in this game. Christian McCaffrey hits the edge. Quay Walker has got to have that sideline to sideline speed. We know he's got the athleticism. We know he's pretty fast for that for as for as big as he is. This is going to be a very active game as I think as well uh I think uh for, for Quay Walker as well. 
he may be the guy that is like, okay, you've got to be the main guy. It's going to take a team effort, but you've got to be that main guy to try to slow down Christian McCaffrey and not let him bust off big runs, not let him you know, be effective in the passing game. Quay Walker is going to probably be gasping for a lot of breath after a, you know, a lot of snaps here, but he has got to be a guy that is ready for this moment. He's going to be counted on to be a big-time factor in this defense to slow down this 49ers offense on on uh, on Saturday night. Number three for me, Jordan Love. Just keep doing what you're doing, man. Keep playing at the level that you're playing, and don't start to read some of these headlines out there. You know, I saw yesterday somebody saying, you know, 49ers, you know, got the got the best car in this one, got the best car in the race. But Jordan Love might be the best driver in this in this matchup. Could be. I mean, essentially that, that person saying Jordan Love is the best player, he's the best quarterback in this matchup. Don't don't start to read these stuff. You know, you're getting a lot of love right now, Love. A lot of love. That win over the Cowboys silenced more doubters. More skeptics. Put him a little bit more on the map. Now you got people saying top 10 quarterback in the league, maybe even higher. He's playing some incredibly, incredibly good football. And he's going to be going up against another defense that's going to be aggressive. Going to be another tough defense. Can he stay patient? Can he continue to stay patient? Can he continue to stay calm? And can he continue to to make plays. The thing, you know, a lot of stuff has impressed me about Jordan Love this year. His poise. His his confidence. One thing I think he really displayed against the Cowboys, he's done it this th- a few times throughout the season. One thing I think really stood out is his willingness to stand in that pocket the very last second, making that throw, knowing a hit is coming, knowing he's going to get hit, but he stands in that pocket, makes the throw, makes a big play, gets rewarded by getting hit. A lot of quarterbacks get a little anxious, maybe throw it away, throw it too early, throw it too late. Jordan Love has been doing a really good job at that. Number two for me is Kenny Clark. You know, we've been talking about Christian McCaffrey and, and all this all this stuff and Again, Kyle Shanahan has proven it time and time again. If he can get away with running the ball 50 times in a game, he will do it. Kenny Clark has got to be a force going up against that offensive line. If, again, we talked about if there was a crack in the foundation on the defensive side for the 49ers, if there's maybe a crack in the foundation a little bit on the offensive side for the 49ers, could be that interior line. Could be those guards. Kenny Clark's got to be a dominant defensive lineman in this game, setting the tone, generating a pressure up the middle against Brock Purdy, being effective in stopping the run on Christian McCaffrey, just dominating the line of scrimmage. If Kenny Clark is going to go out there and have himself a game where he's just wreaking havoc that they can't stop him, he looks like one of the best defensive tackles in, in all of football. He's stopping the run. He's getting after Brock Purdy, getting Purdy off his mark. Packers have a shot in this one. I think this is potentially a big game for, for Kenny Clark, or or Kenny Clark has to have a big game in this one. Wreak havoc in the trenches. And then number one, probably no surprise, Joe Barry. What's the game plan? What's the game plan in this game? We've seen Green Bay how many times being willing to sacrifice the run a little bit and playing the pass here. You got a team now, in my opinion, the most balanced offense in the entire league. A thousand yard tight end, a thousand yard receiver, another receiver that can easily get you a thousand yards, but he's 
such a weapon. And I'm talking about Debo Samuel. You can use him in different ways. And you got a thousand yard rusher. Oh, and that running back could probably almost get you a thousand yards if you really wanted to in the receiving department. Quarterback that's thrown for over four thousand. What's the game plan, Joe Barry? And how are you going to call this game? Are you going to really focus on stopping the run? Are you going to go with the the scheme of the mindset that we've seen so many times this year, trying to force an offense to have you know how many like almost perfect drives each drive? If there's one team maybe you can't do that against, it's probably the 49ers. You probably can't have that mindset of the 49ers like, okay, we're going to force you every time to have that perfect drive or, or try to score on every drive or score a touchdown on every drive. 49ers are probably the one team that might get away with doing that. You probably got to be a little bit more aggressive in this one. Is it a risk? Kind of like last week. Was it a risk to be a little bit more aggressive against the Cowboys? Yes, because they got a really good offense too, or they did. You can't be complacent in that. The risk or the reward far outweighs the risk. Going to have to play a little bit more aggressive. Not 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 stupid aggressive, but you got to do something to force some turnovers in this game like you did last week. You got to the 49ers are going to turn the ball over. If Brock Purdy's going to throw some picks and throw some interceptions. You got a shot at this thing. And if you get off and if you you know Get in a third and and long situation. Get off the field. This is a big game for Joe Barry. What's that game plan going to look like? How is he going to call this game? This is Joe Barry's biggest game of his defensive coordinator career, in my opinion. All right, guess what? That's going to do it for us on this episode of the Man Cave Podcast, brought to you by hy V and Toyson Ford. Appreciate you tuning in and checking out this episode of the Man Cave Podcast. If you don't mind, give us a quick follow and a free subscribe. Subscribe for free wherever you listen to your podcast. And five-star rating and a positive review so others can find the podcast. Till next time, Dan Casper here again. Appreciate you tuning in. We'll talk to you on the next episode of the Man Cave Podcast.